see if it comes to life. There it is. There's me. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, Chris opened. Thank you very much. Um, Chris opened with this idea of nostalgia because it's going to get really nostalgic in here. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, the, the joys of being, uh, being trained as an architect is, is you get to discover this, like, inner storyteller in you because that's really what an architect is, right? You have a story that you want to tell and you have to convince the world that this building, this story that you're making is the thing that they want, right? And um, you are talking about ideas of progression, like moving through a space and, and unfolding this narrative for, for the, the participant. Um, and I don't think, it's, it's not unlike that in, in the visual arts. I mean, this is what I instill, or try to instill in my students all the time, that, that we're just here to learn how to be storytellers. And so I'm gonna go on this kind of like weird story with you and or take you on a weird sort of story. I might go off in tangents, that's just my nature, so uh, bear with me. Um, but I do wanna begin um, here with these images. Um, these images uh, kind of marked the beginning of my, my contemporary photographic practice. Um, I was always a photographer. I, my very first pictures I took, I think I was like five or six years old, and I still have them to this day. Um, I found them in an album a couple of months ago. But, uh, and all through high school, I was that kid with the camera around their neck all the time, and um, I took a lot of photography classes, and when it came time to, uh, to choose what I was gonna do with my future, um, I, I had this passion for architecture, and I was like, well, you know, I've taught myself photography, I can't teach myself architecture, so I'm gonna go to architecture school. And I just like wandered up here, and I was like, oh, this place is pretty, and I found out they had an architecture school, and I said, great, let's sign up for it. Um, and so I just sort of stumbled into this, this really magical place. Um, I know many of you probably had it on your list as like this goal for yourself. Um, and so uh, I cheated a little bit. It wasn't really bad for me, but I, I just, I'm just so happy I got to be here. But, um, but you know, at that point, my, my photography practice was very, what I would say, basic. You know, I was taking pictures of my friends and I was taking pictures of plants and, um, you know, uh, but coming to architecture school, it started to shift. You know, I was thinking a little bit more about space, um, but these images are really important, and I'm gonna get to them eventually, but I just wanted to show you where we're going, um, and a little bit more, too. So here's sort of a snapshot of, of my photographic practice, um, and it, it does sort of go in chronological order. Um, you can begin down here behind my head, <laughs> and uh, this is, uh, this, this building right here actually is, um, does anybody recognize that, that building? I don't know if you guys have been shown this building. This is by No Roof Architecture. Do you guys know No Roof? She hasn't told them? Oh, this, they, they haven't met Margarita yet. Oh, you haven't met Margarita yet. Oh, that's Margarita's house. <laughs> so um, when, I, when I graduated, um, Margarita and her husband Scott had just finished uh, building their their house in Brooklyn and um, and I think this I think it's called the slot house but uh, they asked me to come and photograph it which I, I took as a great honor um, and then you know I, I feeling very comfortable with the world of photography in an architectural way you know you can see that there's a lot of architecture here in the first the bottom row like that's my foundation right um, but then at, at a certain point I, I moved to this like vast landscape and I just want you guys to like look at this this stage right here. You see how flat that is? That's what it looks like where I live. It's like super flat. Um, I live in the this place called the Red River Valley in Fargo, North Dakota, and um, it's an ancient lake bed. And uh, you probably can think about like you've seen pictures of you know farms in the Midwest and you know just this flat, endless landscape. And and that's where I that's where I live, and it and it really started to shift my my own practice because I started thinking about that horizon line and where light meets sky. So um, so you can see some of that sprinkled in here, and and a lot of other images that look kind of weird, right? Like so, 
Um, this one in the very center with these like lines, you know, it's, th those are trees, but they look really weird. And, and there's a picture of the ocean, not all the way on the end, but, but things are a little funky. And that's because I, I'm, I'm an analog photographer and I'm obsessed with this physicality of the photographic space. And so um, the tools that I want to use to explore that are handmade um, pinhole cameras that, um, that make things look a little weird because it's unexpected. But, um, but before I continue with that, here I'm gonna, I'm gonna rewind again. And like I said, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be nostalgic. And I'm going to uh, talk to you guys about the possibilities for you. And I thought standing here in front of you guys who are beginning your journey here at this school, it might be nice to share with you um, my project that I did for my thesis year. I know this is really far away for you guys to be thinking about it. Um, but you know, there is gonna be this point where you have to make this project, right? Um, and this project you're gonna make is not gonna be something that somebody assigns to you, right? You're gonna have to develop it through your own exploration. And, um, and um, I uh, was still struggling. When it came to thesis year, I was like still struggling with this idea, like this battle in myself about architecture and photography. Everybody was asking me, like, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And so I decided to do a thesis that was based in photography. And I'm gonna tell you, I, I feel like I kind of hacked the system a little bit because um, you know everybody's doing buildings. And I was like, you know, I kind of just wanna take pictures and figure out how to use that. Um, and I, uh, I had the, the possibility actually of um, in my fifth year, not my fourth year, but in my fifth year, um, doing uh, the, the residency program in Riva San Vitale. So hopefully you guys all know about this place, Riva, you know, this amazing villa that Virginia Tech has in Switzerland. Um, if you can go, please go. Like, make it a priority because that place is just absolutely amazing. Um, and I missed out on it in my fourth year um, but my, the, the person that I wanted to sit with for my thesis, they were, happen they were gonna be in Riva during my fifth year. So I convinced them to let me tag along. And, um, and so I used my time in Riva to travel Europe um, taking photos and um, building a, a thesis project, which ultimately became moments of discovery and reversing art, what I called reversing architectural photography. So as I said, my time in Switzerland was spent just like traveling and sampling and looking at the world through my lens, um, spending a lot of time with architects uh, uh, Peter Zumthor and Seeger Leverance, like not literally, but like, you know, in their spaces, in their, in their monuments. Um, and, you know, I had my camera with me and I just took a lot of pictures. And what I decided what I was gonna do is, is in this process, I was gonna kind of create like, like my own visual library, you know, um, you guys are, are trained to sketch, right? You, you go out and you look at a space and you draw it. And, and in a way, like I kind of thought of my pictures as my sketches, you know? And my, my camera was my sketchbook, my tool that I was using and, and I was collecting and, and, and experiencing these spaces, but learning about aspects of light and shadow and how they can develop, you know, build a composition um, and, and it, create a sense of wonder. Um, so a photograph wasn't just a documentation, it was like a, a depiction of a moment, right? This, this experience that I was having, having and recording it um, in this way. Um, so after, you know, I spent that, those three months in Switzerland traveling around, um, I, had to, I had to come up with an idea. I had to convince my advisor that this was, you know, a smart move. Um, so just like any good uh, researcher, I had to develop a thesis. And um, one thing that uh, a room in Riva that I, uh, I underestimated when I first got there but ended up spending most of my time in is they have this very tiny, very intimate, very nice little library. I don't know if they're still using this library in the same way, but um, you know, all the good things were in this library. It was like, an, it was like a, a distillation of, of Kogel Hall Library, you know, like everything that you needed. Um, and very specific actually to this region that uh, Riva is in. Um, but I'm sorry, that's a little blurry, but um, I'll just read to you um, what I discovered in this space. Um, so uh, there was a magazine, Architecture and Urbanism, um, A plus U, which I see you still have in the library here, um, but there was an issue that they did on, on Peter Zumthor, 
Um, and I was reading through it because, as I mentioned, I was spending a lot of time in his architecture, and I stumbled upon this passage. If a work of architecture consists of forms and contents which combine to create a strong fundamental mood that is powerful enough to affect us, it may possess the qualities of a work of art. This art has, however, nothing to do with interesting configurations or originality. It is concerned with insights and understanding and above all, with truth. Perhaps poetry is unexpected truth. It lives in stillness. Architecture's artistic task is to give this still expectancy of form. The building itself is never poetic. At most, it may po possess subtle qualities which at certain moments permit us to understand something that we were never able to understand in quite this way before. Um, I, those are a lot of words, but what I would say is that there was just this, um, when, when I read that, I realized that there, was, there could be this connection between the visual representation, the art of capturing a building, um, light and shadow in specific moments, and this, this, this poetry, you know, it's like storytelling um, in a way that captivates the, the viewer or the listener or the participant. So that was my, that was my goal, is like I'm going to go and I'm going to find those moments and I'm going to unlock this truth and this architecture and then I'm going to bring them back and those are going to be my sources for my, my thesis project. Um, I couldn't help but actually define what moment was because I needed to, to understand that word a little bit more. Um, so you can see maybe uh, number four and five are in bold. Um, moment is an outstanding significance or value, something that's important or a brief period of time that is characterized by a quality such as excellence, suitability, or distinction. Um, so that was what I, I jumped into this project with. And then my pictures, right? And so I had this stack of photographs, um, but then I had to figure out what to do with them. So I came back to, to Blacksburg and, and did my second semester here um, on the fourth floor of Kogel Hall. So. It, if you, if you go into Kogel and you come out of the elevator and you take a left on the fourth floor and then you walk into the studio space and you look left again, that corner on the fourth floor, that was my corner. If any of you want to claim it now, you can't have it because it's mine. I spent four out of five years in that corner. I don't know how it happened, but I somehow managed to always land there. So um, I was joking with Chris that I wish I had tagged it somehow so that way I could come back and look at it, but maybe I'll have to do it while I'm here. Shh, don't tell anyone. So, so I climbed up into my little cubby in uh, the fourth floor of Kogel, and um, I started like pulling out my pencil because you know um, we were drawing a lot then. And actually, um, it, this was kind of like right at the beginning of 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 um, uh, what's the one? The drawing? No, not Rhino. It was CAD. Yeah, it was like kind of at the beginning when AutoCAD was being taught in school, and I avoided that class at all costs. So. Um, so I was kind of, I was a Luddite from the beginning. But, um, but so I got out my pencil and I started to think about like how I could translate these photographs, you know, these, these pictures into, into three-dimensional forms. Um, and I was very fascinated in this translation from, you know, you go to an architectural space and you lift your camera up and you hit that shutter and immediately that three-dimensional space is flattened and it's turned into a two-dimensional representation, right? Um, which everything about that representation is related to your perspective, your point of view, where you're standing, you know, what you're editing out, what you're, what you're including. Um, but I wanted to see if I could then translate that back into a three-dimensional form. Um, and so, you know, I started all these experiments. There's a lot of photos here of, of, a, of a mold that I made out of concrete. Um, and, you know, ex trying to figure out how I could make these objects uh, based on these photographs um, which, I mean, they're, they're nice, you know, I was, I was learning things about, like, structure, how these parts are put together. Um, I had to do some, some really funny explorations with a hinge, like, to get this thing to, to rotate. Um, you know, it has a form, but um, it still really wasn't what I was looking for, um, you know, as, as how, I could, how I could make architecture out of my photographs. Um, so... Um, I started reflecting on, on what a building is, um, and I started thinking about the photographs, and I thought, well, what if I just made houses for my, for my books? 
AKA, I mean, houses for my photographs, also known as books, right? Like you look at photographs in books, it all made sense. It all came together. I was like, the answer was there. So, um, so I started analyzing my images and thinking about like how they related to each other um, and how they could be the inspiration for the books. And, um, and so you, you recognize here in, in this book, all the way uh, to my right is, you know, <clears throat> uh, that, that space. This, so this is inspired by the photograph of Seeger, Le Seeger Leverance's, um, no, not Leverance, uh, the church in Brion Cemetery, um, Carlos Scarpa, sorry. Um, there was a photograph I took there and, and it, it seemed like a natural translation of a hinge. And, and so this book was the first one. Um, and, then, and then I built, built this one based on a photograph of Peter Zumthor's um, chapel in Switzerland. Um, and then uh, this was also based on a photograph from Brion Cemetery. And so I started working with material and bringing these forms together. And, um, and ultimately, you know, I had to argue that this was a project that was worthy of an architecture degree. Um, so I started speaking of these as, as architectural forms. And um, of course, my houses, they had to have a site. The buildings had to land on something. So um, I designed a table that they would fit on. And each book sat in a specific location on the table. But, um, but as, as a human interacting with a book, it's a very physical experience, right? Like, you, you don't like walk up to a book like you do a building. You walk up to a book, you pick it up, you interact with it, you flip through the pages. And so um, the focus for me became at the scale of the hand instead of the scale of the human. But I mean, the scale of the hand and the scale of the human are still essentially the same thing. Um, but so I started exploring how one would interact with these books, how they could pick it up off of this table. Um, and uh, I had these really lovely studies that I made of the books um, later on. Um, <clears throat> So you can see that they actually take on a little bit of an architectural form just because of my point of view and the way that I'm framing the images and, and controlling the viewer's experience. Um, but you know, this book here, I want to I wanna point, but I don't want you to not hear me. Um, you know, this book here, it, you grab the, this is like a concrete tray that you take and you extract from this wooden housing and the photographs would sit inside that concrete tray and so this space here related to the the size of my fingers as they slip underneath the concrete right so um, the book also sits on a on a little plinth which you can see here and that plinth locks into the table so the book exists in its space and then there was a home on the table where you would pull that concrete out and lay it down on the home and then you could put the photographs in the space between the two objects and, and view them. Um, this book here, uh, the way that you open it, you have to slide, hmm, I don't have any images here, let's see. I have more, lots more. You can see these, uh, these planes, they like slide in this space and that was inspired by a series of photographs where I had these lines that would move across the composition as if they were planes and so you'd, you'd pull those open and, and slide out the photographs and the table the book also sat on the table in a way that you would have to pull it towards you in, t in order to interact with it um, and then of course this very first book the first iteration um, this concrete one look at that isn't that texture just oh, so yummy uh, but this, uh, this book, it opens up on that hinge and the, the pages of the book sit here inside this, this container. But the concrete, it was really hard to work with because it wasn't a good scale of the hand. And so I had to make this other tray for it to sit in so I could slip my fingers in there and, and pick up the book and interact with it. So, um, so there's buildings and there's sight and they relate to each other. Oh look, there's somebody else's models. Look, you guys recognize that place? Um, so here they are again. Here's that book open. Um, you know, and I started studying how people would interact with it. And this table, it also, um, that's a sideways version, but uh, I, I studied how the toes would fit in this space underneath the table and how, so how somebody would step up to it. And the table had a very specific height. It might have been relating to me and my body because I'm a little bit short, but uh, so taller people struggled differently than I did, but um, it's okay, I'm the designer. Here you can see that book um, being slid towards the participant. Um, and here's all the books spread out on the table. 
Um, and then everything folded up into this, into this compact little box that I was on wheels and I could roll it around and put it in different places. So um, it, was a, it was just such a lovely investigation. And, um, and I was just so, uh, so pleased that, that the response to it was, was actually positive. Um, I didn't win the Pella, but I got really close. So, um, so that's okay, I'll take it. Um, but you know, I, I show you this because um, you know, your destination in this program is really up to you. Like what you bring to the, to the table is, is, is more important than you know, what you gain from, from your faculty and your, and your teachers. You know, um, being engaged in the space and, and knowing what you want and running after it, um, your teachers will value that so much more and, and help hopefully help encourage you to keep going um, on that journey um, because because the story that you're going to tell is is your story right and that's what's going to make your work unique that's going to make you stand out when you when you go out into the field and do whatever it is that you're going to do um, so you can cheat and you can make a, a, a thesis that like fits your passions but you just have to like give it your all and uh, and it'll be it'll be successful. So now, how does that get me to here? Like, you could see those books, um, and, and now this is like not exactly the same thing, um, but there was this uh, story that I wanna tell you <clears throat> from Riva. Um, when uh, one day we were, we were in the, the villa, and um, the professor asked us to come downstairs to the first floor, and in the, in the main space, there was like a little room to the side that was, maybe it was an office at one time, I'm not really sure, but, um, <clears throat> but he, he packed us all in there and there was these really heavy drapes on the wall uh, or in front of the window. And he closed the drapes and then he opened up this very tiny fragment in the curtain so that way there was this small bit of light coming through. So the room was totally dark, right? And then there was this tiny bit of light that came through in the curtain. And this like, I mean, this, this moment changed my life. What happened was is that the outside world was projected into the interior in what's known as a, as a camera obscura. I don't know if you've ever had this experience before, but I was just like blown away. So as a photographer in architectural school, I was thinking very specific about what architectural photography is. You could see that in my photographs, right? You go to a building, you take a picture, and you document it, or you share those images with others. But in this moment, I realized that architecture and photography, like they are one and the same, because the technology that I was using, this camera, is directly related to an exploration of architectural space in the camera obscura. So this is this phenomena um, of projection that you experience, you're experiencing it right now. The same thing happens in your eyeball, right? It's this dark space that has a small hole in it and the, the, the phenomena of the project, projection comes through and the image that you see in front of you is projected onto your retina and your brain figures out what it is and gives you this, this scene around you. And so the same thing can happen in, in any space, any size space. Um, you can go back to, to your studio later today and you are sitting inside of a camera. The only problem is, is the lens, the opening is too big for you to be able to see the image clearly. <clears throat> so in this, in this room here, so this is an artist by the name of Abelard Morel and he's very interested in this phenomenon and uses it as a strong part of his, his photographic practice. But he's, he's a teacher and um and so one day in class he did this demonstration here and and so you can see um this is a box with a hole in it and uh there's he's happened to put a lens on it to focus the image um but you don't have to have a lens you can just have a hole and you will still get a projection and um it is upside down and backwards because there's some physics at play um but Luckily for you, your brain fixes it. When you have a camera, you put a, a sensor or a piece of film in there, and then you just turn it upside down or right side up to fix the image. But, um, but you know, he was demonstrating this, and then so he started thinking about, about rooms, and, and he began building these camera obscuras in his, in his family's home and, and the outside world. The neighbors, like, they were projected into the room, and, 
And then he started traveling the world doing the same thing in, in different spaces. Um, so I just wanted to show you that as like a foundation for, for what I was experiencing in Riva. Um, and uh, that, that experience, like, I started thinking about that too, you know, and how it had such a profound effect on me. And then as a teacher, I wanted to do that with my students. And, um, and I didn't have a place to do it in. So I came up with this great idea in graduate school and again, convinced my advisors that they should give me credit to build what's known as the Trailer Obscura. This isn't really the best photograph because it's, it's a backwards image of the Trailer Obscura, but this is basically a camera obscura on wheels. And so I thought, oh, well, I can't make a room in the space that I was teaching, so I'll just make my own mobile camera obscura, and I would take and I would stuff students into this box um, about four at a time. Um, I had to build like a vestibule space so you could get in and out without disrupting the dark interior space, and, and it was great as a teaching tool. Um, you know, I was able to give the students that same experience that I had, um, but uh, let me just zoom up here to this picture so you can see um, here, the trailer obscura, you can see this little door right here. That's what I open up. That's what the pinhole exists. So um, I built a plate that sits behind that door and it projects onto the interior. Um, but, you know, like why would you build a camera on wheels and not do something with it, right? It just seemed like a waste of effort. So, um, so I started driving around the prairie um, making exposures with my trailer obscura. The very first picture I made, um, I was going to school about an hour and a half from where I lived, so I um, took a bunch of uh, eight by 10 sheets of photo paper, because I had all this junk paper, and I just haphazardly pinned them up inside the, inside the trailer. And then I got to the highway, and I opened up the, the, the lens, and then I drove an hour and 15 minutes home, and then when I got off the highway, I closed the lens again. And I was like, well, I don't know what I'm gonna get. I didn't know anything about the exposure time for this thing, I was just sort of guessing. And then I, I took all those sheets of paper and developed them in the dark room and it just like, the most amazing thing appeared. There's just like subtle gradations of light um, and time that are just, I, I don't know, like I was blown away. And so, um, so I continued to photograph on the prairie um, and you know, I was, I was getting very fixed on this horizon line. Um, and so I decided to come up with a project which eventually became One Mississippi. You're gonna get this in a minute. So um, do you guys, like, so as somebody who grew up on the East Coast, there was this myth about the Mississippi River, right? Like, you have to cross it, you have to go west, this manifest destiny, right? And I don't know if any of you did this, but the moment I graduated high school, I turned 18, I got in a car and I, and I drove across the country and I went across the Mississippi River. It was just this thing that you had to do. Well, in North Dakota and Minnesota, like they don't really care about that because they live right by the headwaters of the Mississippi. So they had this very different impression of this, of this line in the continent. And so I, I decided that I wanted to use my camera, my tool, to get to know this place. And so um, this is a theme that comes up quite a bit and it happened right in my thesis, like my camera as a tool to, to learn more about something. Um, so I took this camera, and here it's on a, it's on a Passat, which I ruined the car on this trip. But um, don't pull a trailer from a Passat uh, for 1,200 miles um, on bumpy roads. But uh, I, I drove down to um, the Mississippi Delta, and I'm just going to open up this site here. I drove down to the Mississippi Delta and started making exposures driving along the, the river coming home. And this was the first one I made. Um, down uh, in, uh, I think it was Port Sulphur, Louisiana, um, down in the Delta, and this is, a, this is an evening shot. This is sunset, um, and you can see that there's this very subtle little bit of darkness here. And the thing about the, the, the pinhole camera, which is essentially what this is, the camera obscura, um, when, you, when you put the light-sensitive material in the box, um, it's, it becomes a negative because where the light hits the light sensitive material, in this case, silver gelatin paper, it gets darker where the light hits and it stays white where the light doesn't hit. Um, so everything, that's why things look a little bit weird in these pinhole cameras because everything's backwards and opposite. Um, so it was actually quite dark. Um, I think this exposure was, 
I mean, I drove during this one. I think this was ended up being like an hour long and, and not much was recorded. But on the other hand, this was taken uh, midday in St. Louis. And this image uh, was a little bit, the, the, the sun was brighter. And so the sky here becomes really dark and the foreground is light because there's not as much light coming off the grass. Um, you know, I, and I continued to move along the river and I was doing this practice where I was taking some still images and some moving images, um, trying to understand how, how I wanted to build these compositions. Um, so that was one Mississippi. Here's that one that was in the, in the first image. I'll go back to that. So this is a picture of me taking this picture. So you can see the bridge. This is where the Ohio and the Mississippi come together. Um, and it was in flood stage, so you can see the water level was really high, and I got these amazing reflections. Um, so, but I got, I got to Minnesota, and I got really tired, and so I s decided to go home. And then a couple years later, I decided to do two Mississippi. Now it makes sense, right? One Mississippi, two Mississippi. This is where you guys all laugh. You gotta laugh, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, so this one uh, became a little bit more focused. So the Mississippi River, the headwaters are in um, Minnesota. So I, I got this map here. And so here, this last one here, this last dot, that's, that's the headwaters. And I live like here-ish. So, um, so I live very close to the headwaters. So I thought I would do a more focused attention on Minnesota. And I think something like something like one third of the river's length is actually in Minnesota, which seems crazy because it's one state. But um, so I went down to Minnesota bluff country and started there. That's kind of where I ended the other exposures and um, started traveling around along the river. And this was an eight day excursion um, from the bluff country to the, to the, the headwaters. Um, and I was sort of doing a hybrid practice. Um, so I didn't show you the original trailer obscura images, but they were, I'll just show you them real quick. So these were the first ones that I was making where you can see that real abstraction of space. Um, I wasn't pausing the camera, I was just driving for the complete duration. So um, this one's called Whiteout because <laughs> it was taken during a blizzard, but get it because it's backwards, it's, it's black. <laughs> see, that's another opportunity to laugh. <laughs> I laugh at myself all the time. Sorry. Um, so, so those were the those were the real abstractions. And then when I did one Mississippi, you know, I was trying to play the other game um, and give people something to look at because people were complaining about the abstract nature and they couldn't get it. So, um, so then two Mississippi, I was like, you know, I'm going to do it how I want to do it. So these are sort of these hybrid images and probably some of the best. Um, so I traveled along this river in Minnesota, and, and part of the practice of this project was to really understand this space. And so I did a lot of historical research about the, the, the search for the headwaters of the river. And so these characters are like living in my head as I'm, as I'm out photographing, you know, these crazy men who decided that they needed to find where the source of the river is. Um, and uh, there were some really good stories, like one guy, he was Italian, and uh, he had this woman that he was in love with, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't, her parents wouldn't approve of the marriage, and so he decided he needed to go prove himself. So what would he do? He would go to the United States and find the headwaters of the Mississippi. I mean, that's what you do to impress a woman, right? And uh, he, he had all this like really fancy clothes and this massive cases of luggage and instruments and stuff. And he shows up in St. Paul uh, and he's like, I need somebody to take me up the river. And they were all laughing at him. <laughs> and these like flat boats and they got all of his, his crap onto the boat. And then, and then the boat got stuck. And then so he ended up having to walk and he made friends with some, some uh, local indigenous tribe and, and they were laughing at him because of his, all of his, he was like walking around with a, with a lute or something. <laughs> it's really bizarre um, stories, right? But uh, he ended up finding a river or a lake that was not actually the headwaters of the Mississippi, but he, it was heart shaped. So he named it after his love. Isn't that sweet? Um, uh, so uh, crazy stories, but so I, these, these people are in my mind as I'm photographing and, and thinking about the exposures that I'm making um, and going to these very important locations on the river, like this one, um, and then again, a very, a very subtle exposure. Um, this was made at a place called Crow Wing State Park, and 
Crow Wing, the Crow Wing River, River and the Mississippi confluence at this really important trade location, um, both for the indigenous tribes and also later the white settlers. Um, and so for this photograph, I just decided to just drive around this park to make this photograph, sort of like making this collection of impressions in one image, you know, so the whole park is contained, like the whole space is contained in this one image. Um, uh, there was a lot of woods, and so that's why it's so light, because the woods were dark, and I could only see a little bit of the sky. Um, <clears throat> and then, uh, let me see if I can find, this one is actually um, made in Minneapolis. Uh, it's on the same, well, no, it's on the Minneapolis side of the Mississippi River, um, but it's looking back to the, to the city because the main part of the city is across the river from this area. But um, this is around St. Anthony's Falls, which is uh, a quite important location in the history of Minneapolis. Um, and so for this image, it's, it's stacked. In, uh, there's like these, this, these moments stacked on top of each other. So I would drive the trailer and park and then drive the trailer and park. And so you get this like cityscape here just sort of overlapping on itself. Here's another dark one. <laughs> That's called overexposed. It's not called white out. So, um, uh, so that was that was to Mississippi, and that that's this this camera that I was using to record these very vast spaces. <clears throat> um, the other thing that that happened um, while I was doing my research. Here's some images along the travel. Um, it's a really beautiful landscape. I, I could highly encourage you guys, like if you want an adventure to just go spend like three weeks driving along the Mississippi River. It's just, you, you get to know like all these different kinds of communities. And there's actually one community in Minnesota that like it, the architecture is very Southern. It's like Louisiana was just transported up the river and, and implanted in Minnesota. And I didn't know about it until I discovered it on this trip and I was just totally shocked. But. Um, one thing that I was, I was coming across a lot of in my research um, was that there was these artists um, back in the 1840s, I would say, um, or maybe it was the 1820s, um, right around when photography was, was emerging. But um, they, you know, they, were, they were also traveling to the river, these artists, and they wanted to depict the river for people back east as like in, in its glory and showing them what the river is about and, and what opportunities are out there for, for travelers. And these artists would make sketches walking up, or, you know, traveling up and down the river. And um, one in particular, and his, his name is escaping me now, but he, um, th he made these, what they called the Mississippi panoramas. And these are epic paintings, okay? So I'm just gonna tell you like, one painting is like the size of this screen here and he would make multiples of these and stitch them together on the ends and um, roll them up. So they were like 300 yards long. So three football fields long, these, these panoramas. And roll them up onto, onto like spools and put them in a theater just like this. And then somebody would like, un like unroll this thing and you would get this like moving picture, literally, right? Of these different vignettes that this painter would, would create. And the artist would, would stand on the stage in the, in the theater and, and describe the scene that was unfolding, um, an unra unraveling behind him. And, uh, and you know, these, these travels, like one of the, the panoramas went from um, New Orleans to, uh, to Minneapolis, and one was St. Paul to Minneapolis. But the, the photographer or the painter would tell the story, and one day, you know, and one day he'd go from from New Orleans to Minneapolis, and the next day, Minneapolis to New Orleans, right? Because you didn't want to unroll it, this massive spool, um, more than once. So I got really inspired by that, and I thought about, you know, this opportunity to take still images, and I decided to make my own uh, panorama. So as I was creating these large-scale images, I was also making these small vignettes, um, which I call, of course, Mississippi panorama. So. Here you can see the trailer is parked and looking into the woods, and this is the impression that, that was made. Um, and so for this project, the, the previous trailer pieces, they were like eight by 10 sheets of paper that I, I stitched together, but these were 11 by 14 um, sheets. And so they exist in diptychs and triptychs. Um, they're really dark. Um, 
which I actually kind of liked. There's this mood. Uh, this is in Winona, Minnesota, where there's this really interesting enclave um, sort of in the middle of the river. So there's an island in the middle of the river where a lot of vagabonds live and people in houseboats, like really rickety houseboats, and they just pull up there and, and live uh, in this space, but it's kind of swampy and dark. Um, here's that one, and this is actually the town of Frontenac that has this very southern architecture. Um, and so these became different vignettes. This is Crow Wing State Park um, that I told you about where I was the, the, the specific um, uh, trade location. So I'm, I'm traveling along and I'm making these vignettes and uh, I bring them together in this uh, panorama. And now mine's not quite as epic, but it is 32 feet long. So um, it's made up of, of 32 framed images. Um, and they're actually uh, placed um, sequentially along the river when you view it in space. So, um, so that's my, my Mississippi panorama. Um, but you know, this exploration of, of space and, and getting to know places, like it becomes this theme in my work. Um, and then I start inventing projects so that way I can travel. <laughs> it's a good idea too. <laughs> so um, I wanted to do some work in Utah. So I was thinking a little bit about um, what kind of a camera I could build to photograph in Utah. And um, my very good friend lives there. And uh, I was talking to her one time and, and she grew up on the ocean. And, and I asked her like, why did you move to the desert? It's like, you couldn't get any more opposite the ocean. And um, I said, there's nothing, there's nothing alive there. And she said, well, you just have to change your perspective, right? Everything that lives in the desert lives at the scale below the knee because that's where that's where they can collect food and water. Um, and so I thought, well, why don't I build a camera that actually photographs at a scale below the knee? So I went and bought a hat box and I put nine apertures around the perimeter. And, um, and I created a series called Your Land. Now some context to this, um, this these photographs were made on the Grand Staircase in um, Escalani, Utah, in and around Escalani, and at the point that these photographs were being made, um, the uh, newly minted Trump administration was deciding that they were going to start to pick apart some of the public lands out in this area to um, to mine. And so, you know, this was the this was the the theme that was um, weighing on me as I was photographing these places. Um, I'm not going to get into the the politics of it. Instead, I'm going to talk about the poetry. Um, of these images, but that's why it's called Your Land. Um, but remember that this box is, is really small, so it's resting on the ground. And what surprised me the most about this project was like these infinite senses of scale that emerged in these images that I, I, had, I had no idea what they looked like when I made them because they're encased in this box. I don't have a viewfinder, so I'm just sort of like winging it. I have an idea about what the exposure time is. Um, uh, but here you have, here in the foreground, these are like grains of sand, right, and little sticks. And um, in the middle space, you've got trees, and this particular place has, has stone monuments. But then out here in the distance, this is what's called Navajo Mountain. It's right next to um, Lake Powell, and it's really far away. It's like 150 miles from where this photograph is taken. So all these experiences are stacked into this, into this one photograph. And, and that was like, again, like, you know, in, in the similar way that I, could, that I could photograph a whole, you know, space in, in Minnesota and stack that into one image, the same thing is, is happening in these. I was just like pumped. But they look weird because nine pinholes overlapping each other, like you get all these reversed exposures and things are kind of wonky. And so, so it's disorienting, but still it's like, it's like a dream, you know, it's like these snapshots of my, my time in this place. Um, so here, uh, this one is very tiny. So this is like, like a mouse could live in here, right? And so uh, definitely experience that, I, that I, I'd never had in the desert. So it gave me a very different impression. These images are, are positives because I, I took the negatives and I, I made them positive, but they're about six inches tall by 24 inches wide. Um, there's a lot of slot canyons that we went to. Um, this is a very prominent feature of this area of Utah. 
And I don't know if you know what a slot canyon is, but it's a very narrow space that's carved away by water in the sandstone. And, uh, and when, I, when I developed this picture, I almost cried because um, it almost looks like it's underwater, like as if this was taken underwater, but this space is made by water, you know, and I, and I love that, that experience of, of this image revealing itself um, in the developer tray. Another slot canyon. Doesn't it feel like water? I just, oh, so yummy. Um, so this surprise that I'm talking about, you know, that I, I can't see the image when I'm taking it, and I really don't know what I have until I'm developing it. Like, that's what actually keeps me going with this analog. Um, if you do a lot of digital photography, which I'm sure you do, as soon as you take the picture, what do you do? You look at it, right? You want to see what it looks like, so that way you can make a judgment on it and decide, am I going to keep this? Am I going to delete this? Am I going to post it on my Instagram, right? But I, I don't have that... I don't want to call it a luxury, but I don't have that ability with this process, and that's what, that's what draws me to it, this, this constant search for serendipity and, and the, the surprise that comes. Um, so uh, here's some images of, of the camera in the field. I love to see it so small. Look, it's so tiny and cute. I, I didn't really, the, the circus theme is not really intentional, but it was the only hat box they had at the store that I went to. But now I kind of like it because it, it stands out really well. It's, this one is like hidden in there somewhere. This is the picture of the mouse trail. There's one, it's over there. Um, but I also, uh, we went to this massive space and you can see me here like, you know, how do you carry a hat box around in the desert? And you turn into a turtle, that's what you do. Um, I, I had the, I have two small daughters and um, I took, well, they're not so small anymore. This is when my oldest was five and she came with me on the trip. And so she was a participant in the, in the making of this, um, which was really special. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna show you one more camera um, that I, I'm working on and, and so, this theme of like understanding space, you know, those other two cameras were really about looking at spaces that were far away and distant to me. Um, same with the thesis and a lot of my projects, like I said, I want to travel, so I make projects, but um, then I started thinking a little bit more about the more immediate spaces. Um, you know, I think this comes to like how we can affect our communities. Um, you know, what can we do to uh, tell the story of, if, of our spaces, or me specifically as a visual artist? Um, and, uh, and so I, I have this crate camera, and this was originally designed, um, again, this is <laughs> a picture without the pinhole. Here's the pinhole for this one. It's a modified crate, and so I have this um, electrical uh, outlet. It's like for a floor outlet, and I can spin out this little interior thing and I have a pinhole in there. Um, but this one I, de I designed because I really wanted to go to California and I wanted to take some pictures. So I, I made this box and I put all my darkroom equipment in it and I shipped it to California and I made photographs out there and developed the images out there. And it was like, it was like my Instamatic camera. <laughs> but, um, and then I shipped it home. So it's a shipping crate. But then I started thinking about like how I could use that. And I had done initial tests at home. Um, and as, as I mentioned, I live in this landscape that um, is really flat, but I live right along um, this river that floods periodically, which is my favorite time of year. And uh, I'm, not, I'm not being sarcastic. It's really beautiful. This like landscape becomes a lake and all the waterfowl come in and it's always in spring when we're just desperate for some sort of um, expression of life. But, um, but so I, I, I loaded the crate up on a, on, a, on a wagon and I bring it out and I put it out in the river and I'm exploring different spaces along, along the river and thinking about different times. And, um, and then so this project is it's it's called the riverscapes and so here's that that funny one that i was talking about so again it's in a negative but because it's on wheels like i can't resist i gotta move it so this is like a multiple exposure stacking um, this one particular space on top of itself um, here's one where you can see actually um, the crate is in the water so you get this really lovely soft reflection in the foreground 
Um, and so just like exploring this landscape with this tool and, and stacking this, this whole space on these singular images. Um, I mean, the, the project is, is exciting in a way, but it's not like um, a big one for me. But what it did was it started to unlock this idea of, of how we look at the spaces that are close to us. And so this is sort of how my, my practice is shifting now. I'm not, I'm not going out so much as, as looking at um, my, my home and my space. And so um, I started working on this North Dakota field survey project. Um, and I don't really know how to do this project yet. Um, I've been really exploring different ways to, to tell the story of this, this place visually um, through the local ecology. So it's not just about you know, the landscape and the space that surrounds us, but you know, down to a different scale, sort of coming out of that, that hat box. And so these threads are coming together and I'm building off of my practice. Um, so in this image here um, on the right, 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 <laughs> um, I have uh, some um, prints that are made with silver gelatin paper, and this is really cool. If you expose silver gelatin paper to light and you don't actually go through the full development process, it makes this really nice creamy pink color, um, and it varies depending on the manufacturer, the paper manufacturer. But, um, and so these are, are impressions, images that I made with large four by five negatives and then, and then contacted those to make these, these images. But it's sort of like a taxonomy, like these are plants that I collected along the river and sort of trying to, to build this language of, of what makes up this, of, of the flora that makes up this landscape. Um, I'm also kind of obsessed with honeybees. I've uh, built a camera where you can actually photograph honeycomb. Um, there's cartridges that I've designed that fit inside a, a, a standard beehive and the bees like make the honey in the cartridge and then I take the cartridge out and put it into a camera and then make these photograms of, of honeycombs. That's not how these were made. Um, it's still in its beta, beta stages but um, the idea is similar to the hat box. Like I wanted to understand how to photograph different kinds of spaces and um, honeybees like they're you know this token animal in the climate discussion. Um, but the other thing is that in North Dakota, North Dakota is the number one honey producing state in the country. So I thought I could actually, you know, build a narrative around there. But these ones are, are just chunks of honey that I had, of comb that I had, that I made photograms of. So, um, so you know, trying to figure out how to visually tell that story, um, which leads to, like, I guess my most recent project, which is not a pinhole camera. <laughs> But um, it's, uh, these are, are cameraless images, these are photograms. Um, and it's a process where you take a light sensitive material and you put an object on top of it and expose it to light. And um, depending on the translucency of the object, you get an impression and it's a negative impression. And so similar to uh, the pinholes where the light is, the image becomes darker and where it's blocked, it really, the, the paper, the color of the, the foundation paper is revealed. And I'm a little bit cryptic describing this process because um, this particular series um, is this process called carbon printing. And this was a, a, a process that was developed in the 1850s as a way to um, make images positive. Um, and it's actually a printmaking process, but through the process you actually have to build a tissue um, with gelatin. So you basically make a solution of jello, like the jello that you would eat, and you infuse it with sumi ink in this case. Um, and that's where the, the term carbon print comes from because sumi ink is uh, an ink that's developed. Um, you take, you burn some, some willow, like the, the trees, and then um, you grind that down. And the, the black that comes from that, that, pro, that, that grinding, the burnt willow, becomes embedded in a liquid um, to create an ink. And the, the depth of the black is just like, it's, really deep and, and luscious, but, um, but you take that ink and you put it into the gelatin solution and then you pour it into a, into a tray and uh, on, a, on a paper substrate and um, later on you sensitize that tissue and then you can use that to make a photographic impression. So um, I was really interested in this idea that I could use a carbon-based process to capture, to record carbon, so, because that's what these plants are. 
Um, so I went to a, I had a residency at a, at a farmstead in North Dakota. And I made these, these impressions by collecting plants from, from around the property, primarily um, trees. Uh, and then um, I presented them as a rebuild of the, the landscape. Um, and uh, I have a, a video of it, but it's a little bit long. So I'm just gonna fast forward a little bit to show you the installation. Um, because uh, the, the thing about my work, which doesn't really translate here, is the, the final presentation, this physical nature of the, of the image is really important to me as you know, one would relate to, to the scene or uh, to the piece um, with the body, right? You, that started with the book and eventually evolves um, into other spaces. But I'm just gonna fast forward to here. So as I was, as I was photographing and present, or developing these prints, I started pinning them to the wall and I'll just let my words say the rest. Let's see if they come up. And as it was completed, collecting them in groups with similar plants. To my surprise, a landscape began to emerge with each plant in its proper place. From this practice, I knew that I wanted to present the work in a similar manner on the gallery wall. Building the installation is a tribute to the landscape the plants came from. As settlers immigrated to this region toward the end of the 19th century, they set their roots, establishing homesteads surrounded by shelter belts to protect them from the harsh northerly winds. They tapped into the rich carbon-filled soil of the grasslands, producing a bounty of row crops to feed the growing nation. Efficiency measures and mechanization led to monocultures and a reduction in biodiversity. This resulted in the tragic loss of a majority of the tall grass prairie. But ecologies are not fixed in time and vegetation is in constant flux. The small homestead acres and shelter belts dotting the landscape have become biodiverse islands in a sea of monocultures, micro ecosystems and incubators of the future inhabitants of the wild agrarian prairie. So um, there's a lot more layers to this, this project than I've alluded to, but it's, it's there a little bit in the words. Um, you know, the, the landscape that I live in has been tremendously transformed. Um, and sometimes I like to think about what it's gonna look like in the future when we're not here anymore and how the plants will reestablish themselves. Um, but it will be a different landscape. The landscape will never be what it was before the settlers came. Um, because we have a different climate and plants relate differently to the, the climate that we live in now. So, so this is sort of my, my futuristic vision of what the future will look like um, in North Dakota. Um, uh, <clears throat> so, um, so this is kind of a weird tangent. Like, yeah, it's not related to architecture, but um, I do wanna, wanna say that this isn't like so far off base. There was a point in architecture school where I actually considered transferring into landscape architecture because I was thinking a lot about um, what architects were doing to the planet and the landscape and this constant building. And I was thinking a lot about like what kind of a, a mark I want to make. Um, I ultimately didn't shift, but I, I had a pretty strong interest in, in plants and ecology and, and that continues to today. And so that's sort of where my, my research exists today. It's like everything happens on a loop and it goes in full circle. Um, so as I, as I close now, because I think I'm about at my time, I just want to say that, you know, everything, every impression that you carry into this space, you will probably find that again in your future. And, you know, there's, there's all these threads that are going to come up in your life here and, and as you emerge. And, and I'm convinced that all of you can tie it back to a specific moment in the time that came before that. Um, and just pay attention to those threads. 
um, because those are, those are going to be the words that, that make the stories that you end up telling um, as you become professionals and, and move into the world. And uh, if you can, get a chance to give a lecture because it's a great time to reflect on, on your practice and um, helps, to, helps you frame what you're going to do in the future because I have all these ideas now after, after looking at, at where I came from. So. I want to thank you all for uh, coming to listen to me talk today. This is a huge honor. Um, I never stood on the stage at the Lyric when I lived here, so here I am now, and uh, I hope you all get an opportunity to do something similar in your future. So thank you. I do have the ability to control it somewhat. Um, I, I have made some um, tests with a light meter, basically like you would use with a camera. So I have a sense of what um, the base time is for what I would call sunny 16, um, which is sort of this like standard measure of, of light and exposure. Um, so I can control it, but I also like to play with it a little bit. So sometimes I use, I, I take a measure of the light and decide, well, this needs to be a 10 minute exposure. But sometimes I also like to think about, well, I need to go from this point to this point. And so instead of deciding that I have to do that stretch in 20 minutes, I just decide, I say, well, what will happen if I make the exposure for that, for that length? So, um, so it's sometimes controlled, but also depends on, on the mood I'm in. It's a good question. Do you end up changing the, the size of the pinhole if you want to drive further into the smaller? Um, well, no. So I do have two apertures that I made. One's a little bit bigger, um, only because when I'm, when I'm setting up uh, an image, um, like those still images, I needed to be able to see the image projected into the trailer pretty quickly. So I have a larger aperture, so I can kind of stage a composition if that's the mood that I'm in. Uh, but then I always use a very, it was like the tiniest drill bit I could get to drill through the metal. And I don't know what the number is, but that's the one that I always use for the exposures. I like to keep it tiny because then I, it gives me a little bit more flexibility with the time. Questions? All the way back. picture that tells a thousand words is that what you said was my favorite picture yeah. I love that you use that phrase because that's like that's actually an assignment I give to my students like is it possible for a picture to tell a thousand words um, oh, that's a really you know <laughs> the problem with with making artwork is like the last body of work that you made is always the best <laughs> and so so for me like this this series is probably the most developed in that sense, but not because of any particular individual image. Um, you could see the way I was hanging the work on the wall. For me, the collection is, is a whole piece, and that is for me telling, telling the full story. But this is like a new avenue that I'm exploring, this idea of collaging on the wall and it not being this traditional installation. And so, um, so yeah, I think it's this last project for me, yeah. So the question is, is um, if I've ever thought about um, working with color. Um, yes, I have thought about it, but there's some like pretty serious challenges to that, um, only because uh, the technology for color, um, the, the light sensitive paper and material, um, it's a little bit harder to work with and um, the chemistry is different. So it's more of a logistical challenge than anything. However, I did do a, a workshop in Omaha and um, the place that I was at, they had a, a color processor that you could just send paper through and it was 
the chemistry was washed over the paper and they had a huge roll of, of color paper. I think it was like 20 feet long. So we actually put it in the trailer and, and wrapped it around the interior of the trailer and made, made an image. And um, it wasn't what I expected because it was a negative. So it, it actually looked like fire because the negative was like reds and oranges and, and whites and creams instead of, instead of the black and white. But um, I get that question a lot. And I, one of these days I will, figure, <laughs> I will figure it out and do something with it. But it's a good one. Thank you.